At the beginning, we see Yuki Mifune, a trained assassin with ties to the Yakuza, watching a live news report about Bruno Diaz. Diaz, a foreign diplomat, is in Washington DC for a significant agreement to lift the trade ban between Costa Verde and the USA. Just as Diaz is about to start his speech, Mifune shoots him in the head. Chaos erupts, and Mifune swiftly leaves. She has accomplished her mission. Agent John Franklin is on a call with the Secretary of State when Agent Juliet Clover informs him that they've identified a prime suspect in the shooting, Brandon Beckett. He's been tracked flying in and out of Costa Verde shortly before the attack. Franklin then instructs Agent Sarah Peterson to dispatch a private team to Beckett's residence. Beckett, enjoying a video game during his long-awaited vacation, his first in five years, has no idea he's become a suspect in an assassination plot and is on the verge of arrest. The sound of a hovering helicopter fills the air, followed by a sudden explosion at his door. Armed men rush in and take him into custody. Mifune reports his arrest, stating he was apprehended just meters from his house. She's been assigned to eliminate him and make it look like a suicide, but that plan is no longer viable. The alternative is to target his convoy once he's en route to a holding facility. At a CIA safe house, Franklin interrogates Beckett, who vehemently denies any involvement. Franklin points out they have his DNA, flight records, and a motive that links him to the attack. Franklin is convinced of his guilt. He's also concerned about Thomas Beckett's possible involvement. Beckett firmly denies any connection to the killing. The interrogation is interrupted by Homeland Security agent Zeke Rosenberg, who requests to speak with Beckett. Rosenberg assures Beckett that his judgment will be based on facts. He cautions Beckett that he'll be transported to a black site, and if found guilty, the consequences will be severe. Beckett firmly maintains his innocence. Franklin re-enters and directs his men to escort Beckett out. A member of a Russian mob is hired to stage an attack on the vehicle transporting Beckett. While negotiating over the phone, he insists on receiving payment up front. With the deal settled, he readies his team. Rosenberg approaches Clover, who admits to discovering the crucial evidence. Rosenberg confides that he holds high regard for someone who doubts Beckett's involvement in the assassination. Clover shares the video of the shooting, illustrating how they managed to pinpoint the shooter's location, which was over a mile away. She believes only someone with Beckett's expertise could accomplish such a feat. Rosenberg concurs and points out a person in the video who appears out of place, Donald South, the CEO of Novosil Pharmaceutical Company. Meanwhile, a team of Russian assassins tails the vehicle transporting Beckett. Beckett senses that something is amiss and warns the officers accompanying him, but they dismiss his concerns. Shortly after, a truck obstructs their path while the pursuing vehicle draws nearer. The driver attempts to flee but is rammed by the other truck. The Russians open fire on Beckett's car as a precaution. Both officers are shot and lose their lives in the line of duty. Beckett seizes the opportunity to retrieve the key to his handcuffs and makes a daring escape. He grabs two handguns and waits for the approaching Russians. Beckett manages to kill one and injure the other. Mifune, watching from a distance, witnesses the entire event. Just as Beckett is about to drive away, she takes aim but misses. He makes a successful getaway. Mifune then turns her attention to the surviving Russian and eliminates him. In California, Rosenberg tails Donald South, who is seen on a date with someone other than his wife. Rosenberg approaches their table, demanding South's attention. The date leaves, and Rosenberg takes her seat. He seeks to understand why South was present at the scene of the assassination. South explains that he has advocated for lifting the embargo and reveals that his pharmaceutical company is on the brink of being absorbed by Ficus Industries. He suggests that Rosenberg should follow the money, as they might be the ones behind the assassination to prevent the lifting of the embargo from happening. Peterson updates Franklin on Beckett's situation, revealing that he was ambushed by a Russian mob and one of their agents was killed by a sniper. Franklin suspects it might be Beckett's father trying to protect him. He instructs his team to search for both Beckett's, as they have located the vehicle that transported Brandon. Brandon, desperate to avoid capture, engages with two police officers. Realizing he can't afford to be arrested, he fights them off and successfully escapes. He then seizes a nearby car and orders the driver to take him to a specific location. In California, Rosenberg confides in Clover about the possibility of a mole in their department leading to the ambush of the transport vehicle. He believes he's Brandon Beckett's only hope, especially now that Franklin suspects Brandon is guilty. He inquires if there have been any findings on Ficus. Clover informs Rosenberg about an incident involving an accountant at Ficus Industries attempting to access a restricted area, triggering an alarm. 
Although the police responded, they were denied entry. Rosenberg asks for the accountant's name and proceeds to search for him in Vancouver. The accountant's name is Josh Strayhorn. Upon arriving in Vancouver, he is greeted by Drake Phoenix, the head of security at Ficus. Rosenberg is informed that Strayhorn's incident was minor, as he was unwell and accidentally triggered the alarm while inebriated on the wrong floor. Beckett leaves the car in a parking lot and discreetly boards the back of a cargo truck. He rendezvous with his father in a secluded area, revealing that he's been framed. Rosenberg urges Clover to investigate Phoenix, but surprisingly, there's no official record of him. Franklin becomes aware of Clover's communication with Rosenberg regarding Ficus and emphasizes the importance of finding Beckett. Once Franklin departs, Clover promptly shares the name and hospital location of the surviving Russian. Rosenberg arrives at the hospital but encounters resistance from a security guard. He displays his badge, gaining access. The doctor informs him that the Russian is still recovering from surgery. Rosenberg insists on waking him, as he's a suspect in an assassination. When the Russian regains consciousness, Rosenberg commences the interrogation, pressing him for information on who hired him. Initially uncooperative, the Russian succumbs to pain as Rosenberg applies pressure to his fresh wound. He reveals that the person who hired him used a voice changer and created a background noise resembling a helicopter. Rosenberg understands the need for deeper investigation. Franklin's team continues to gather evidence at Beckett's house, and Peterson discovers a birthday card left by his father, containing coordinates. They leave Rosenberg behind as they track down this location. Rosenberg notices a photo of Beckett with his military comrades. He takes a picture and sends it to Clover, who confirms that one of them is Drake Phoenix, previously known as Clark McConnell. He was wanted for war crimes, but supposedly passed away five years ago. Rosenberg locates Strayhorn and, when met with resistance, presses a gun to his head. Strayhorn confesses that Phoenix threatened his family, compelling him to cooperate. He discloses that if the agreement isn't signed, Novasil's stock will plummet, which is where they'd profit. He also admits he was setting up an offshore account when the alarm sounded. It was Phoenix who coerced him. Beckett and his father observe armed men approaching. His father hands him a rifle and directs him to a tunnel. As the men draw closer, Franklin receives a call from Rosenberg, who persuades him that he now possesses enough evidence to exonerate Beckett. Franklin explains that Strayhorn had already confessed. Reluctantly, he ordered his men to stand down. However, gunshots ring out, and Franklin's men are systematically taken out. Beckett, who had managed to cross to the other side, hears the shots and rushes back to his dad's house. His dad retrieves a rifle and they both search for the assassin, unaware that she's watching them. Instead of shooting, she creates a diversion to escape. Beckett and his dad are determined to capture her alive, recognizing that she's the key to clearing Beckett's name. They manage to catch up with her, and just as she's about to shoot Beckett, his dad aims at her gun, allowing Beckett to close in. To their surprise, it turns out she's a woman. Beckett and his dad had been under the impression they were dealing with a man the whole time. Beckett engages in a fight with Mifune. She's skilled with various weapons and an expert in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Beckett struggles to keep up. At one point, she manages to trap him and brings him to the ground, rendering him helpless. She reaches for a handgun to finish him off, but his father stealthily approaches from behind and points a rifle at her. It's over, she surrenders. In Vancouver, Rosenberg investigates Phoenix's residence. He finds incriminating evidence, including tickets to an island. He persuades a boat operator to take him to the island with a helipad. When interrogating the wounded Russian, he mentions struggling to hear over the noise of a helicopter. Franklin receives a call from Beckett, who informs him that the suspect is with him and willing to cooperate. Franklin advises Beckett to stay put, as his second team is already en route. Clover uncovers Mifune's background and is working on establishing a connection between her and Diaz. Franklin confirms to Beckett that they have evidence placing Mifune in Costa Verde on the day of the attack. Clover also reveals that framing an American for Diaz's death was a ploy to derail the trade agreement. This would have caused Novasil's stock to plummet, benefiting Phoenix with the help of Strayhorn. Mifune is en route to a maximum security prison. Beckett suggests a plan, let Phoenix believe she succeeded in killing him. He adds that Phoenix framing him was a way for him to seek revenge. Beckett had reported Phoenix to their superior when he witnessed him killing an innocent woman during a reconnaissance mission. Mifune calls Phoenix and informs him that she is Beckett. Phoenix sends her the address for the rendezvous. Meanwhile, Franklin plans the execution, with Beckett's dad volunteering to be the sniper. Rosenberg manages to infiltrate a residence on an island. 
he finds a family portrait featuring Donald South, which surprises him. Suddenly, Phoenix catches him off guard, leading to a fight. When the dust settles, Rosenberg is tied to a chair, and South reveals his motives. He knows that after the merger, he won't be needed as the CEO will come from the larger company. He also admits that framing Beckett was Phoenix's idea. Mifune arrives to deliver Beckett. The rest of the team, including his father, are in position in case the plan goes awry. She confesses that she was hired to kill Phoenix's brother, accidentally killing his nephew in the process. Beckett and Phoenix come face to face. Phoenix demands they go inside. Franklin then orders to extract Beckett and eliminate Phoenix. However, once they are inside, Phoenix shoots Mifune. Beckett manages to free himself from the handcuffs and engages in a fierce struggle with Phoenix. Phoenix gains the upper hand and takes Beckett hostage, making demands for a chopper and $10 million, threatening to kill Beckett if his demands aren't met. Beckett's dad receives the green light to take the shot, but he hesitates, haunted by a past fatal error. As the tension escalates, Beckett reassures his dad, expressing his trust in him. He knows that his dad is watching through the rifle scope. This gives his dad the courage to take the shot, ultimately killing Phoenix. South attempts to flee, but Mifune catches him and subdues him. The movie concludes with Beckett approaching his dad. His dad acknowledges that it was one of the most challenging shots he's ever taken. They share a hug and decide to celebrate with some cold beer. Don't forget to enable notifications for more thrilling movie recaps like this. Thank you for watching.